the commanding officer of the RLI, Colonel J.S.V. Hickman, M.C., now invites the Prime Minister to inspect the parade. Regimental Sergeant Major Tarr advances to collect the colour. He draws his sword, and this is in fact the only time that a non-commissioned officer ever does so. The colour, bearing the unique flame lily emblem, is handed over to the ensign, Second Lieutenant Price, and the escort presents arms. Escort! To the colour! On the left! No! Now follows the actual trooping of the colour, to the strains of the march, The Incredibles, composed by Director of Music Frank Sutton of the Rhodesian Corps of Signals. The Prime Minister himself provided the inspiration for this march when he toasted the incredible RLI at a mess function. The battalion is too young for any battle honours, but by popular accord qualifies for the accolade Zambezi Valley. It has borne the brunt of anti-terrorist operations in Mashonaland with spectacular success. Several of RLI men have given their lives in these actions. Thus, this flag, intrinsically valueless, is a symbol extrinsically priceless, calling to mind acts of collective and individual heroism. Well, I'm uh, happy to be here today with a, a very old and dear friend of mine, uh, by the name of Don Price. Don, uh, Major Price, uh, won the Bronze Cross of Rhodesia, um, comes from an old Rhodesian family, uh, so he's got military history steeped in the, in the blood and um, got a very interesting story to tell about um, his experiences during the Rhodesian War, which he was involved in for almost the entire duration. Don? Start with um, your dad. Where did? Yeah, my dad was born in Salisbury. So I'm an old Rhodesian from an old Rhodesian stock family. <coughs> he was uh, fought all the time, uh, the whole duration of the Second World War. He was a gunner with the Eighth Army, an anti-tank troop, and uh, they were the guys that took out a lot of those German tanks at Monte Cassino. Um, he was very chuffed that I wanted to go to the army, but never thought I'd pass the officer's course. <laughs> it's always downplay things. But um, yeah, I went. To, uh, we, I grew up in Madibin Land in, at Filibuzi, a little place, a little mining town. My old man was a uh, chartered accountant and did uh, the books for the mine. And I went from Filibuzi to Plumtree School as a boarding school. <clears throat> and I think the interest for the army started there because. Uh, Plumtree had a, a school cadet uh, history and uh, a lot of the guys, a lot of prefects and uh, head of houses and so on and so on from the school went to Sandhurst, went to School of Infantry, uh, you know, the Cox, the two brothers, uh, Patrick Armstrong, Jerry Strong went to Sandhurst, sort of honour, uh, Tony Bent. Um, just a long string of names and had an honours board in the school and so it was just sort of fait accompli that I would go and go on an, on an OSB and see if I could pass and go on an officer's course, which, which I did. I, and I was then badged RLI and I went to 3 Commander. Um, early days uh, in 3 Commander, we're talking about 69, was straight after Bob Cauldron, I missed Bob Cauldron sadly. Uh, John Hickman was the CEO and he knew of my background <coughs> coming from Filibuzi and the bush and all that. 
and Plumtree, and uh, very quickly on made me the tracking officer in RLI. And I would accompany, take young uh, guys from the different commanders, while well, we were all young guys, take the guys in tracker teams and go with them and uh, up attachments with the SAS and work in Mozambique. At that time, right in northern Mozambique, Fingui and Beni and those places. And that was where we first started operating uh, tracker combat teams, or four-man teams, and where we got to know, learn. And we, we learned all of that from the SAS. They were the founders of the tracking thing. But when I came back to RLI, I continued as a tracking officer. And then um, I was, I had been like four years in the RLI when uh, Al Turl, who was our CSM, got commissioned, uh, got a training commission, and he went to take over the tracking school from Brian Robinson. Uh, Brian Robinson who formed the tracking school, tracking and bushcraft school at Kariba. And uh, Al Turl was captain now and went there to take over uh, running of the tracking school and so on. He was a very, very fine soldier. And on an exercise in the Boomy Hills, uh, a non-tactical phase of the exercise, he was sitting on a rock and uh, the guys were cleaning their weapons because there was light gooty. He was attacked by a lioness and the thing hit him from behind, actually broke his neck and the jaw, the front jaw came through his chest and the back uh, teeth and that through his back. And uh, Andre Robbie was one of the instructors there, managed to get his weapon put together quickly and ran after, because the old tour was being dragged out of the, the sort of area, dragged backwards by this lioness and Andre fired bursts over the lion's head and eventually the lion let go. And uh, they then moved fire and put fire around there and sat with El Tool right through the night. Now there was a hell of a storm at Kariba and uh, helicopters couldn't come in to go to Kazavak and neither could a boat be sent across because of the high sort of waves and, and high waters on Lake Kariba. So the first time the aircraft could come in, the chopper could come in, was first light when they brought the doctor in. And the whole night on Al Tool had been dying. And he was dying from his feet upwards. He'd get the guys to prick his leg or his ankle and with a knife, and he'd say, no, I can't feel that anymore. Come up high. And, then, and he was, had Andre Robbie sitting next to him writing a letter to his wife. So Al Tool died uh, when the chopper arrived just before uh, the doc could actually try and give him anything. And three days later, I was moved from RLI uh, to take over the post of OC Tracking Wing, which I stayed on, uh, stayed there and became the first training officer of the Salu Scouts and was a founder member of the Salu Scouts. But that's another story. Don, um, let's, <coughs> let's fast forward a bit then. Uh, to fire force operations and um, something about the tactical uh, concept and um, actual events. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, when Bruce Nelgar was killed uh, in the accident, um, I think it was a '78. I was I went up for the funeral and. Tufty Bates was the CEO, and at the wake afterwards, Al Tufty said to me, I want you to come around, I want you to come with me in the car, I didn't know where we were going, anyway, we drove around the uh, battalion, past the quartermaster store, and turned right, went down to three commander, and took me upstairs, and the whole commander was in the room, and old Noel Smee, who was one of the subbies, <coughs> came to me and said, Three magic words. So I said, well, yeah, I don't know what three magic words. And he said, drinks all round. So I said, okay, drinks all round. So, and I was the new OC. And I think John was there as well. Anyway, um, went straight into the fire force thing. Orla was doing tremendous amount of fire force. I mean, uh, high, high kill rates. Um, and absolutely loved the fire force concept. Loved the, the adrenaline rush it gave you. It was probably... One of the most exciting things to be in command of, um, that airborne envelopment. And uh, it was like playing a game of chess from the air, positioning your troops, doing the dummy drops, doing the sweeps, putting in airstrikes, um, kazavacking guys, working with the blues. It was a tremendous, tremendous job. 
And uh, I think Nigel Henson, if I remember correctly, and he was a fantastic KCAR commander, <coughs> who I have a huge respect for, he's uh, had the record for, I think, eight contacts in one day. Sure. Uh, I can't claim anywhere near that. I think the most I had in one day was five, but even five is a tremendous amount of, of punch-ups to go into. <laughs> And at the end of the day, when you come back, you feel like you, you've been writing exams, you know, for university or something. You're totally drained. Your mental sort of, you'd want to have one beer and then collapse, you know. But uh, it was a tremendous uh, adrenaline rush fighting a battle from up top there in that observation point. I had, I remember bringing in Canberra uh, alpha bomb strikes and the cameras came underneath me in the K car. And then you, they would... Uh, let go of these and they had these uh, pods either side of the aircraft and drop 500 bombs at one time or in pockets wherever they wanted to do them you know and we had this this was in the bite bridge area and they dropped all these uh, these alpha bombs and and it was the most amazing thing to witness from the air because you're right above them and these bombs these explosions were going off and it was like being in the, on, on, a, on corrugations you know in that aircraft because you were bouncing with all the explosions underneath you and seeing the guys run and falling over and all the rest of it. And then when the K car would open fire and the 20 mil cannon would engage, uh, every now and again you had a direct hit and there was just this orange flash and the gook had, had been nailed, would just disappear, vaporized. It was just the most amazing thing to witness from the air. So it was very, very exciting and uh, I was very lucky and all the time that I did fire force I never had lost one guy so I was very chuffed about that. Don, um, <clears throat> I know the conversations on, on seem to focus on the sort of frontline elite units, the SAS, City Scouts, RLI, but um, you went on to spend a lot of time with just your, your uh, Rhodesian National Servicemen. Yeah, and yeah. Um, and I know you had a you had a very interesting rewarding time with them, um, yeah, yeah. and maybe tell us a bit more about about those guys. Yeah, I had um, I had a fallout with uh, Uncle Ron at uh, at the start of the Salute Scouts thing as the training officer, and he posted me to one brigade. I didn't want an admin job. I felt I was a, an operational soldier. So I applied to Peter Rich, who was the, the B, uh, brigade major, because he was an SAS guy, and uh, he said, you've got to hang on, we've got to check this out, because as an officer, you get invited to attend a selection course with the SAS. You don't just say, I'm going on a selection course. If they don't want you there, you're not going to get in there. So anyway, cut the story short, I did the selection course, passed it, and uh, then Brian Robbie was down in, in South Africa with Reed Daly and Reed Daly put in a bad word for me, Robinson came back and I was RTU'd. So Hickman, who was the brigade, brigade commander, one brigade, was my ex-CEO from RLI, said to me, you take a week's unrecorded leave, when you come back, uh, we will, uh, I'll have a plan for you. And, and what he did was he got both those, those CEOs down and, and had a um, really sort of chap chaps talk to them wasn't chuffed with them and Robinson was posted very shortly after that um, and Hickman said to me look I can't reverse the decision that they made but what would you think about going to an independent company which is the national service company that you're talking about and I thought oh my goodness now you know for me to go from the RLI to a national service company is just not the thing but then if you really looked at it, the national servicemen were the guys making up the RLI anyway, you know, so there was no difference. Uh, they were there in a the unit, sure, but um, we were the same officers and the NCOs, RLI guys, uh, working with the national service company. So I said, yeah, well, what did I, I, it was either that or leave the army. So I went to one in-depth company as 2RC. I served 2RC for maybe three months. Uh, then... I, uh, the guy that I was, um, had, well, he was OC, couldn't handle uh, national service guys. And so uh, Brigadier, oh, sorry, Barnard, 
called me and said, look, uh, we're posting this guy out. We don't need to talk about who it was and we're making you the OC. So I was the OC at one end of company for five years and, uh, sure. and absolutely loved it. It was like being the CEO of a, of a mini uh, battalion. You only reported direct to brigade. Uh, and the deal was, you know, you could do anything you wanted to. You could experiment and do all these things and, and have sport and so on, but just don't make cock up because you didn't want to be in, in trouble. Uh, and the deal was, you, if you got, did well, you got a medal. If you didn't do well, you were, you know, posted or crapped on or whatever. So, but a couple of things in that independent company, just to show you, when I was at Mabaluta with one end of company, um, the Grove International Road, I think it was, was being constructed on the other side of the river in the TTL there, going down to uh, Crook's Corner, that part of the world. And the good presence was quite strong in that area. And they were taking vehicles off the road and burning them and just doing their own way with, the, with all this Grove International equipment. And we were told to toss, I was tossed by Brigadier Barnard to do something about it. So I had a CID guy there called uh, Hreif. I don't remember his first name now, good guy, young guy. And we came up with this plan that we were going to hijack one of these uh, tipper trucks ourselves, which we did do, and we took the driver and his 2RC and said, right, you're not allowed to go anywhere, you stay here with us. We looked after him with grub and gave him beers and everything and cokes and so on. He was fine. We parked the vehicle under the canopy of the vegetation on the side of the river and we hit it with uh, camouflage nets and everything. The reports went in the vehicle. It had been stolen by the gooks. The aircraft went up and looked for it for a week. And then everything went quiet. And this was now our cue to do something about it. And the guys sandbagged, up, sandbagged the rear of the vehicle. And we practiced on the airstrip. And then when we thought things were right, we did our first ride. And I was in the back with the guys. There were five of us in the back. I don't know why there were five, but anyway. Uh, Semi-automatic shotguns, browning shotguns, and folding but AKs. So now you're inviting a, a hijacking or an attack of some Yes, we want, we, all, we want these guys to come and give us a rev. Mm -hmm. And the drill was that uh, Alkriev was the driver because he spoke fluent uh, Shona and he was blackened up in the front with a balaclava on, and he would hit on the back of the cab if, we, if he saw any gooks or if he was approached by anybody, and that would be our cue to be ready, and then we'd listen, and we heard them, we'd engage. First morning we went out with this plan. We hadn't even been going, going for 20 minutes when suddenly, bang, bang, on the back of the vehicle. Everybody, wow, you know, what's going on? And uh, in these voices, these guys started, hey, comrade, hey, comrade, this, and all the rest of talking to old Kreev, uh, you know. And that was our cue. We came over the, top, over the side of the vehicle, of the dungeon. we were shooting down at like, I don't know, five yards max, six feet in some cases, with shotguns and AK. There was a group of nine gooks. Uh, didn't know that at the time, but when it was over, we established that. We killed seven, and we wounded one, and one guy got away. Uh, but he dropped his gap. So it was great success, and we were then able to tell Brigade what we had done. <laughs> <laughs> and then, Don, you actually did some recce work as well. Yes. Um, you know, having been uh, found a member in the Scouts and all that, I was quite upset that we, I didn't get to do that kind of work because I loved that, that idea of pussyfooting around by myself or with another guy with a small team. And so I trained up my own guys, again, national servicemen, and we formed a recce team. And the SP guy was only too chuffed to, to give us his, the weapons and, and the kit and equipment to do it because it was, the int was coming back to him and made him look good, you know. And we, uh, there was a huge Zipra presence in that... Um, um, Matetsi. Matetsi area, thank you. And uh, they were coming in and out from Botswana at, at sort of Lib, and... So we decided to take a group in there and have a walkabout and see what we could find out. And we crossed, uh, one evening we crossed the border uh, with the moon phase right, and, but the drill was just to go a short distance in, get across the, uh, the road, the main road going down to, um, from uh, Kazangula to... Big Falls. Francis Francis yeah. And, uh, and then... 
a setup and then try and pick up some int and see what tracks we could pick up and if we could have any uh, set up an observation point on the road, da da da. Anyway, uh, early in the morning to get my bearings because it was a very, very flat area and hard to map read in Botswana then, featureless, you know. Uh, we were all in a little 360, six of us. I take a, a normal recce team was four, but I had two extra guys that I was training. And so we were in a little 360 and the guys had their packs against the trees with my pony, very scant uh, vegetation that yellow fine grass that you get in that part of Matabi land. And uh, we were, little gas cookers were going and are cooking tea and water, boiling for tea, when suddenly I heard this clicking and it was Finn O'Donoghue, who is the one guy on the left, uh, 11 o'clock position, and he was giving me a gook sign, you know, quite sort of frantically, the thumb down, and then I could hear this noise, and these guys were coming towards us. And it was a large group. And the guys that were on that side, I was in the rear of the circle. Uh, I was like at six o'clock position at the bottom. And uh, they counted them. And there was a hundred gooks coming out of Rhodesia in file, uh, walking back to their camp in Botswana. And they had uh, one of their own guys tied up, warped it up with wire. And a guy was signed as a guard and was prodding him with an SKS bayonet in the back and they were giving him a rev and talking about, oh, you let the side down and you're a coward and wow, wow, we're going to, pro we're going to sort you out or whatever, whatever. And that is why they missed us because they walked 20 yards, 20 meters from us and, they, and we just lay there with our hearts in our mouths waiting for this gang to move past us, you know. And it seemed to take forever and eventually they'd gone past and then the few of that, we waited and they'd gone I moved position, put it, got us into a culvert on the side of the road where we hid in the culvert, waiting for it to get dark. And then when the moon phase came up, uh, we went out there, myself and Theo now, and did a little 360 and picked up the tracks, which was very easy. Uh, I mean, 100 guys walking in file. It was this silver path with the moon, you know, in the grass, aerial spore, and we tracked it. And we went off and we left the other guys there. <clears throat> we went off to go and find out where they'd gone because obviously they'd gone to a camp. And we came to a very big camp that had uh, pulled boxes for sort of sentry posts around the camp. We had identified three of them. We were trying to go around the, the perimeter when suddenly there was this huge burst of fire inside the camp and lots of shouting and clapping and guys firing weapons in the air and everything else. And initially we thought we'd been seen and somebody was shooting at us, but then it was very obvious that they weren't. And what we could make out, they'd culled the guy they were bringing in, they'd executed them. And <clears throat> on leaving the rest of the group to go in and do the close recce, my orders were, okay, if, if you hear any firing or whatever, we will move to a crash RV and we'll, we'll get together there and then we'll make our plan from there. So... Uh, I up sticks and went to the crash RV, found the guys, got them together, uh, no talking or anything. We got into extended lines, so we were just leaving the tracks of one guy every five yards apart uh, if they tried to, if they picked up any movement of us. And we moved into Botswana and did a big arc around uh, about five kilometers and eventually came out down, well down below the camp. And then found a copse of trees a couple of kilometers inside Rhodesia and got on the radio and asked for the SB on Mike Howard to come and fetch us and he picked us up. The, uh, the report went in, we worked right through the night putting in this, uh, my report, so he, you know, the SB had to have the thing typed up and everything. And it went to ComOps. The next day, ComOps sent an aerial f photographic run, or whatever they called it, recce, uh, with the cameras, with a camera at 30, 5,000 feet or whatever it was done at. And sure enough, they picked up the camp. Uh, my grid reference was pretty good when everyone <laughs> worked out. There were no gormos to work from. Um, and the camp was a zipper camp, a food transit supply camp, uh, just west of that big road that we spoke about. And um, for 550 guys, so it was a pretty big camp. Um, it was kind of sad because they initially did not 
put in a reaction group to go and take them out because they were worried about the Rhodesians working on the rail line in Polit Francis Town. Polit political implications. Political be. implications. Mm -hmm. And but the big problem was they sent in uh, scouts guys to verify. They didn't believe the little independent company could come up with that sort of end and that size camp, whatever. They sent in a couple of scouts guys, and sadly they were compromised and the whole gang split. So it was it was a bit sort of negative in the yeah, end. A bit disappointing. Don, um, I know later on you went back to the RLI, and one of the <clears throat> big battles you were involved in was um, Op Tepid in, in Zambia. Yeah. Uh, Near, near the town of Siavonga. Yeah. I know that was um, that was a that was a tough uh, target, as it turned out. Yeah. But you were very involved in the whole operation, and it's a, it's a, it's an interesting yeah series of events. Correct. I'd just been back in the battalion a week actually when we went. Uh, we were called uh, and told we weren't allowed to leave barracks. We were, and then early morning we were flown by DAC down to Kariba with a landtail following. At Kariba, um, there was a sand model laid out there. Al Tafti Bates was the CEO and Brian Robinson was uh, SAS was there. And um, they were giving their orders group and so on. And basically it was a, bat a battalion position in Zambia on these two ridges um, and they were considered to be a classical war, um, part of a classical war regiment that was coming, well, the idea or well, the aim was they were going to advance along several axes up to Salisbury, one of them being the Churundu Salisbury Road and there were going to be tanks and armoured cars and so on and so on but this was the first uh, advance guard, if you like, for that uh, advance. Um, SAS had been in and done the recce. Uh, the, the one aircraft run that uh, Bob McKenzie was in, the Lynx, took a lot of uh, rounds and, and the undercarriage was shot out and he had to do a forced landing back at uh, Kariba, which was really interesting. Anyway, they had done their recce and guys had been on the ground and they had established there were these two uh, big uh, mountain range, it was more than a hill range, it was like two mountains running parallel to each other and in the in the middle of it was the admin area with a little pan and uh, three commander under myself was to attack the rear uh, position, uh, the one ridge and um, one commander with P-10 was to attack the front ridge on a two-pronged pronged attack and we were to go in uh, the next morning at first light uh, using the cheetahs or those Hueys. And uh, I brought up at the at the orders group, funny enough, uh, and got a rev about it from both Robinson and, and uh, Ian Bates. Uh, I said, well, you know, with these positions being that close, what about uh, if they've got heavy weapons like 12 point? 12 sevens or 14 fives, whatever, they're not going to rev us on the ground roll. Uh, of course, they'll be mutually supporting if they're a classical war thing. Ah, oh, you're getting shot away, you're talking about School of Infantry stuff, don't worry, we've got the air support and we'll have this and we'll have that. Well, the next day when we went in, uh, I couldn't believe that we went with the choppers right over the position. Uh, I was looking out, you know, there was no doors on the chopper, I was looking out the side and could see the gooks in the trenches. Um, they had bunkers and everything, and they were just cowering down. They, they could have taken us all out if they'd wanted to. Uh, but a considerable amount of gooks on top of each ridge. Anyway, we landed, the attack went in. Uh, they did exactly what I said they would probably do with a, the with a heavy machine gun. And they uh, revved us in the ground roll. Pete Heen's position was revving our position, and our position was revving them. And when afterwards, the next day, when we went through, and they, uh, we'll get to that, but uh, there was a field telephone line laid from the one ridge to the other. So they were talking to each other on field telephones and saying, you know, these guys are coming up here now, and they're on their uh, left flank or whatever, give them blast with a 14 fives. Or, you can imagine how they were doing that. And they were firing 75 recoilers at us, 
and we were under heavy uh, 82 mortars. Uh, so it wasn't an easy thing. We had, I know P-18, uh, one commander had 15 guys wounded. Luckily nobody killed. I had uh, my first guy, um, Andy Horton, uh, one of the Horton twins, uh, his brother Nigel, in fact, three commander guys are with contact with now, he's back in Harare. But they were together and old uh, Andy Horton uh, was shot in the head and died. And, uh, but a very, very well defended, uh, difficult thing to do, you know, to uh, attack a defended position where they dug in. And when they had all the hard stuff with them, they also had cleared fields of fire and so on. And uh, anyway, we got a massive rev. We couldn't go forward. We were pinned down. The aircraft couldn't come in because it was low cloud. So that all was out the window. A uh, small window of opportunity came in one time right towards the end. And the, the hunters were able to throw down... Uh, 30 millimeter fire and uh, rockets and some uh, golf bombs, but it didn't really do anything. Uh, that night, uh, under what under heavy fire, they had 122 rockets as well, which were exploding behind us because of their range, uh, but very very uh, demoralizing because of the 64 kg warheads exploding and the whole sky being alight and everything else. Uh, they did a typical classical war window, uh, shop window effect. And under all that fire, they did their escape. And they had their route planned and everything else. And that was where Dave Greenhouse was with his little team uh, back at base. <coughs> the CO had picked up through intercept that they were uh, withdrawing. And he quickly scratched together a group of guys, old Brian... Lewis uh, was 2RC with Dave Greeny, and they went in there and these guys, none of them even fired weapons, you know, a lot of them. And these blokes, 400 or whatever it was, moved, walked right past them and guys stopped and had a pee right next to them and that kind of thing. And well, Dave Greenhouse was crit criticised for not opening up on these guys and I stood up for him at the debrief and uh, as far as I'm concerned he did exactly the right thing. I mean it was suicide, that sort of gang of guys to go against 400 gooks coming past in the middle of the night, hard zipper core guys. The other interesting thing about that whole punch up uh, was that a year or so later I was in Surrey Street now. So being, after the wars ended? Yes. Yeah. Doing an elephant hunt in the um, uh, Tulocho area with Simon Rogers, the safari company, and an old American friend of mine, old John Estes. And uh, I noticed this big black guy was working there for Simon as a, as a truck driver, you know, and I noticed that he was very disciplined and that he was different to the other guys. So I approached him and his name was Kanan Yati. And I said to him, uh, Kanan, were you a soldier? You know? So he said, yes, yes, I was. So I said, oh, where were you, one RER, two RER, where, where were you? He just smiled and he said, no, no. So I was, I was with uh, whatever uh, Zipra battalion it was. And it turned out he was actually the 2RC of that position that we were attacking. <laughs> so that night I asked my client if he could come and sit at the fire with us. I uh, offered him a beer, he, wouldn't, he didn't drink, he had a Coke. And we sat and we talked, uh, and it was very, very interesting to hear his side of the thing. He, they thought they were being attacked by 1,200 men, and that's why they pulled out. They had just sent off a whole section, a big chunk of their, their battalion, to go on resupply, and they were going to be re, uh, resupplied with vehicles and stuff. And the vehicles, thank God, didn't come in while we were there, but they were expected uh, to bring in new troops. That would have been something else. But... Uh, it was a it was a battalion position, but an under strength battalion position. So they weren't a thousand men, but I think uh, my memory serves me right. If they were, were all there, it was going to be in the region of eight hundred. But when we hit, there was something like six hundred there. So it was pretty strenuous stuff. When we took when we took the position the next day and swept through, we found fourteen five guns that were firing uh, at the hunters. Uh, we found the gunners laying sprawled over the guns. They were very, very brave guys, I want to tell you. 
and they did uh, an outstanding job firing back at those hunters. And you talk to the hunter pilots afterwards, my goodness, they couldn't believe the flak that was coming up at them. But the gunners were killed on the on the guns, and they were there. They had an underground hospital where guys were in bed with drips in and so on. It was well, well organized. And they were the guys that would kind of come up and do that advance to Salisbury. Very interesting. Don, um, just before we close, uh, tell us about your Bronze Cross. What was it? Mm. What was? Um... It was for external ops uh, in one in, in the company. Quite funny, actually, because a uh, sergeant from RLI, who remained nameless, when I joined 3 Commander again, said to me, well, you know, uh, we don't accept that you've got your Bronze Cross uh, because you didn't get it in RLI. <laughs> so, you know, like the medals committee just works here. So, anyway, uh, very funny. But uh, the bronze was given, and I was put up actually for a silver cross. It was for that recce on that big camp 550, and other bits and pieces. Like I did, we discovered another camp at Kazangula, which, if you remember, uh, the SAS was put onto. We did the recce, we discovered the camp, we discovered the, the guys in this village right there, and I forget the village you may remember, Hans, because we hunted there. Mm. And so the SAS were put there, Colin Willis and Daryl, and when the vehicles were bringing the group out, they ambushed them, and there was this big international mm. thing. But that was also one end of company. So that was part of the thing. And uh, old General Mike Shoot was on the... Um, medals committee and in fact he put me up for the gong which I wasn't really happy it was more for the company than for me but anyway and he said uh, I'll be honest with you, uh, you we put you up for a silver cross uh, because there'd been parallel things done with scouts and they had got silver crosses for locating a camp I think he was talking about one of the black officers that, that ended up getting a silver and something else and but uh, your your old enemy, old Ronry Daddy, uh, squashed the plan, and it was put down to bronzy. So that's how it happened. Well, Don, thanks a little bit for your time. No, thank you. Fascinating, Good fascinating talking. stuff, and um, nice to hear about the the other the other side of of, of the story, um, and. Uh, that's what we're going to do. This uh, the next interview. I hope is um, with a with a former Zipra guy who I've become very friendly with, mm. um, who I hold in very high regard. And uh, oh, they've got some big training yeah, and they're good soldiers. Eh? Yeah, uh, a terrific guy. Also spent quite a bit of time in the Soviet Union. Yeah, and came back as a commissioned officer. And um, it's 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 always good to hear. Yeah. The other side of the Absolutely. story, they, uh, they had issues and they, were, they also um, felt that they were fighting for a cause. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's just nice to, uh, to hook up with these chaps now and uh, get another perspective. So Absolutely. hopefully we'll have that in the next few days. So. Fantastic. If I could just tell you quickly, on Kane and Yati did nine years military training at the military academy in Moscow, in Russia. Nine years. <laughs> Quite something. Yeah. I mean, those guys were better trained than the oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. All right, Don. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks buddy. So. Been great.